and abroad. Welcome to this webinar. I am Sumit Kumar Madan from Zydus Life Sciences Limited, and on behalf of Zydus, I welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Maria Campillo, Chief Guest Dr. Manish Nema, all discussants and participants to this virtual symposium on management of anemia in low risk MDS. Before we commence the proceedings, I would like to welcome and introduce the host and the convener for this continuous medical education series under the edges of Mumbai Hematology Group, Dr. M.B. Agarwar. Sir is Professor and Head Department of Hematology, Bombay Hospital Institute of Medical Sciences, Mumbai. He is also associated with other esteemed institutes as well, like PD Hinduja Hospital, Leelavati Hospital, Portis Hospital and Breach Candy Hospital in Mumbai. He is the president of Mumbai Hematology Group as well. I request Dr. M. B. Agarwal to navigate this program further. Sir, over to you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sumit. Good morning to one and all. Today, our guest speaker is Dr. Maria Campello from Spain. And she will be speaking to us on management of anemia in low-risk MDS. This webinar is brought to you by Mumbai Hematology Group. It is supported by Zydus, managed by Perfect Square. I thank Mr. Ashish Kumar, Mr. Sumit Madan and the team from Zydus, Mr. Yash Kalpesh and the team from Perfect Square, the Executive Committee of Mumbai Hematology Group, our chief guest for the day, Dr. Manish Nema from Indore, our guest speaker, Dr. Maria Campello from Spain, all of our discussants who are themselves eminent hematologists or hemato-oncologists New participants for sparing your Sunday morning, afternoon, or evening, depending upon from which part of the world have you logged in. Just to give you the flavor of next weekend, Saturday, 4th November, 7 p.m. Indian Standard Time, we have guest speaker Dr. Gautam Borthukar from MD Anderson speaking to us on co-binding factor leukemia. And the next Sunday morning at 11.30 a.m. Indian Standard Time, we have Professor Andrew Davis from uh, UK speaking to us on Medicine Large B Cell Lymphoma. Our discussants today are very important people from India, Myanmar, and Bangladesh. We have Dr. Akanksha Garg from Zydus Hospital, Ahmedabad. Dr. Amit Khurana from Akanksha Hematology Center, Surat. Colonel Dr. Ashok Meshram from INHS Aswini, Mumbai, Dr. Asharful Haq Chaudhary from Dhaka Medical College Hospital, Dhaka, Dr. Gopinathan from MGM Healthcare, Chennai, Dr. Kamil Kumar Patel from Marengo CIMS Hospital, Ahmedabad, Professor M.A. Khan from Dhaka Medical College Hospital, Dhaka, Dr. Mona Vijayaran from Sahara Hospital, Lucknow, Dr. Roy Paletti from uh, Ames, Delhi, Dr. Saroj Dhankar from Ames, Raipur, Dr. Sudhir Kumar Atri from Pandit Bhagwat Dayal Sharma, PGI-MS Rohtak, Haryana, Dr. Y. Mon Thant from uh, Myanmar, and now it's time to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Maria Campello. She's Associate Professor, Department of Hematology at the University Hospital of Salamanca, Spain. After graduating from medical school in 1999, she started medical training in hematology. Since 2005, she has been working in the Department of Hematology at the University Hospital of Salamanca in Spain. Between 2006 and 2009, she completed a three-year postdoctoral fellowship provided by ISCII. From 2009, she was responsible for the section of morphology and hematimetry in the hematology department. And since 2017, she held a position of associate professor of hematology at the University of Salamanca. Since October 2016, she's heading the MDS team at the University Hospital. Her clinical expertise lies in hematological malignancies with a focus on MDS and AML. The main scientific interest involves the translational exploration of innovative treatment options for these patients. She's a member of the Spanish MDS group since 2009 and now heads this group since 2018. 
She's also involved in the European MDS Cooperative Group. She will speak to us on management of anemia in low-risk MDS. With the availability of loose fetal sept in India, this has become an important subject today as we have almost the whole gamut like erythropoietin, darbepoietin, lenalidomide, and loose fetal sept available to us together with oral azacitidin and other HMAs. Before I invite her to give the lecture, let's have the inauguration by our special chief guest, that is Dr. Manish Nema, my friend and colleague from Indore. He is a distinguished senior hematologist and hemato-oncologist, and as I said, he is based in Indore. With extensive expertise in this field, he has made a very significant contribution to the field of hematology. He completed his medical education at Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose Medical College earning his MBBS degree, followed by specialization in internal medicine. Fascinated by the intricacies of blood disorders, he pursued further training in hematology and oncology. He completed his DM in hematology from Mumbai, that is King Edward Memorial Hospital at St. G.S. Medical College, gaining comprehensive knowledge and honing his skills in this field. May I request Dr. Manish Nema to inaugurate our today's webinar and give us some words of wisdom. Over to you, Manish. Uh, Manish, you are muted. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, very good morning to all of you. Uh, I am having sore throat, so my voice quality might not be good. Sorry for that. And thank you very much, sir, for kind introduction. I am very thankful to Dr. M. B. Agarwal, sir, and Mumbai Hematology Group for kind invitations to be the chief guest for this webinar. I would like to discuss why should youngsters take up hematology as a subject. Hematology is a constantly evolving field and is on the forefront of the most dynamic developments in the area of molecular medicine, including development of individualized targeted therapies and technology advancement, like NGS, PCR, whole genome sequencing, we are provided very efficient in detecting several mutations implicated in the pathogenesis of hematological disease. New targeted treatment is coming out every year, so disease understanding at a molecular level is a must. Rapid advances in diagnosis and treatment increases the life expectancy and decreased death rate. Outcome is improving drastically. You will have the opportunity to stay up to date with the latest research technologies, and methods in hematology. Although challenging but exciting and rewarding field, apart from treating benign and malignant disease, transplants, you get plenty of exposure in diagnosis and treatment of unusual infection complications like tuberculosis, fungal, viral, PCP, etc. You also get, uh, get great opportunities for research work in hematology. Second thing, which is the most important, is that you love this field or not. So you should have some rotation in hematology and hemato-oncology clinics in undergraduate and graduate programs. Connections with mentors in the field of hematology is very important. You should attend various conferences in this field, especially Dr. M.B. Agwalsar's talk. If you are passionate about the field, you are you can succeed even in the peripheral places. There is great need for trained hematologists. In India, it is very much important how to give world-class treatment to patients with financial constraints. Ever since I was studying hematology in 2002-2005 at KM Hospital Mumbai, could barely miss any talk of Dr. M.B. Agrawal, sir, because that is something Thing you won't get anywhere in our generation and today's Google generations as well. The moment you share any patient's related problem, the solution will come to you in a short time with the latest knowledge and update. He is our forever source of inspiration, wisdom, and knowledge since then. Apart from this, I look forward to learn from Dr. M. B. Agrawal, sir, is the time management, how he can manage time with so much busy schedule. It's my privilege to be a part of this webinar. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Well, thank you, Manish, for sparing your time and speaking to us. Our relationship is right from your student days in Mumbai. 
And thanks for yeah. all the kind words you spoke about Mumbai Hematology Group and myself. So now we come to Dr. Maria Campello. I'm extremely grateful to her for sparing her very, very valuable time, getting up early morning. Uh, it's been indeed privileged today that we are going to learn so much from her experience. And uh, I think without wasting much time, let's give it to her to give a talk and then we will discuss with her. Over to Dr. Maria. Uh, Ma'am, you are muted. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. It's a pleasure for me to participate in this uh, meeting. Uh, Dr. Agarwal, thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. I think you can see my, my screen yes. during guests. Okay, the, 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 during the next uh, minutes, we are going to have the opportunity to review the current management of anemia in the patients within the lower risk LDS setting. Nowadays, we have several new options, and it's uh, great to discuss uh, with you uh, these new opportunities for the patients. Here you can see a resume of my disclosures. And the first, uh, the first thing that, that I always have to take into account when we think about to, to start a new treatment in patients within the lower risk setting is that we need to improve uh, the site opinion of the patients in order to improve the outcome. And this is based of uh, these features because the majority of the patients do, with the lower risk MDS during disease evolution are going to be anemic. And in more than 50% of them, they are going to become, need, uh, to become transfusions in order to improve uh, anemia. And when the patient is uh, in, in the transfusion setting, not only the quality of life is uh, poor, but also these uh, transfusions are going to decrease overall survival. And when we decide to treat a patient in this uh, setting, we need, of course, to try to increase hemoglobin level. These are the goals that we need uh, to reach with the treatment, but also we need to decrease our uh, transfusion and try to reach transfusion independence. And in this uh, setting, we have to take into account that our patients are not the typical hematological patients. They are completely different and they are uh, because they are no atypical uh, hematological malignant patients. They used to be older patients, generally with comorbidities. And for this reason, the patient uh, needs a treatment with a very favorable, uh, favorable uh, profile uh, uh, of the treatment. The treatment needs to be safe uh, and, and the adverse event not uh, to decrease quality of life. And of course, the administration of the drug should be reasonable because if we are treating these patients with uh, drugs uh, that are not in these situations, we are going to decrease quality of life. That is one of the goals of the treatment. Here you can see a resume of the current NCCN guidelines version. This is the last one updated in October uh, 2023. And of course, we have not a lot of uh, options in this setting, even that we have several uh, uh, diagrams or uh, situations. We only have, as uh, Dr. Agarwal commented on it uh, previously, three drugs currently on treatment, lenalidomide, ESAs and loose patterns. And we are going to review the, the main characteristics of each uh, on what, uh, drug uh, in order to address uh, the clinical uh, benefits in the patient. Let's uh, start with this uh, first, uh, erythropoietic stimulating agents in lower risk MDS. These are, of course, uh, currently for uh, the majority of the patients, the first line treatment for the patients in symptomatic anemia. And this is based in, on the results of efficacy of very a lot of uh, registry data and, and, and in Europe is uh, have uh, recently approved in 2018. And the majority of the data based on these uh, registries, here you can see the Italian one and the Spanish one, uh, say, uh, shows uh, the, the same results. Efficacy results around 60 to 65% with a very good safety profile. 
the an administration because these uh, drugs are administered uh, in subcutaneously every week and with no relevant and frequent adverse events. Of course, uh, these uh, drugs are not associated with uh, AML uh, incident, accumulative incidence increasing. Uh, is very safe in this context and is a, very, a drug that is very uh, used in this clinical context. The median duration of this treatment is about 1.5 or 2 years. It depends on the series. Here you can see the results of this uh, in Spanish uh, cohort. And we have uh, the, this algorithm to clearly identify the patients that are going to respond to the treatment. And it's based on the Hippo levels and transfusion dependency. And even that we have, as you can see in the slide, several other uh, identifications uh, of response. With these two variables, we are going to identify clearly the patients that are going to best respond to this treatment. And this algorithm is based on the, on the, of the study in 2003 and is currently uh, on, uh, on, on the clinical setting because we use this algorithm every day. Uh, when the patient has no, uh, no one of these uh, two adverse features regarding transfusion dependency and low WIPO levels, uh, we are going to have a high predictive response rate to this drug, up to 70% of them. So we are going to choose this drug, of course. And if the patient is in one, is in one of or two of these uh, adverse uh, features for response, probably we should move to another one. And regarding the transfusion dependency, recently we have the results uh, uh, published in, in the Lancet Journal of the Commons study. And I think that this is very relevant for the clinical setting because in this uh, clinical trial, in which patients uh, were naive uh, for treatment and in transfusion dependency, these are lower risk uh, patients, ESA naive, who require transfusion, uh, the clinical trial uh, compares uh, Luz Patterson in first-line treatment as compared to ESAs, hypo-alpha, uh, for these uh, patients in transfusion requirements. And the main results confirms that Luz Patterson in this setting is better in order to reach transfusion independency as compared to ESAs up to 58% of them reach transfusion independency in the loose pattern set arm as compared to only 31% in these uh, patients receiving hypoalpha. So probably the majority of the patients that are uh, naive to ESAs but are in transfusion dependency, the, the best treatment option, especially for patients with real sideroblasts, as you can see here in the slide, uh, because this score was uh, very uh, had a lot of patients with these characteristics. Uh, in this setting, probably the best treatment op option, even in first line, could be Luz Patterson. It's uh, still not approved in Europe, I think also in, in India, but it's currently approved in uh, USA based on these uh, results. And of course, the duration of the response, as you can see here in the, in the slide, is completely longer, longer uh, in the patient receiving those patterns. So probably this could be uh, a modification in the next, uh, during the next months or years in this first life treatment, especially for patients with residroblasty, in which uh, the benefit is uh, even better. And finally, when we try to increase uh, this uh, quality of life in the patients, increase the cytopenia, we need to try finally to in, try to improve the outcome in patients in response. And in this setting, even that we don't have a prospective clinical trials, yes, you can see the results of the Spanish uh, NDS uh, group, uh, the benefit in survival is associated probably to a better uh, hemoglobin level, less uh, impact in the deterioration of comorbidities, and finally the patients have an improved overall survival. And here you can see the comparison uh, of uh, more than 700 patients receiving uh, ESAs as compared to the supporting care in our cohort. And in this uh, subset of patients, the benefit is clearly pretty high. 
And the last uh, thing that I want to comment on it is that uh, probably it's better always to start early the treatment in patients in the offset of anemia. And here you can see the curves for the study, the figures for the study of the European MDS registry, that is a prospective study in which we compare the patients receiving with anemia in the same level below 10 grams per deciliter, uh, receiving early uh, ESA treated as compared to not uh, treated and as compared, of course, with patient in transfusion requirements. And when we decided to start the treatment early, uh, around 10 grams per deciliter, uh, in the early onset of the anemia, the benefit of the treatment is clearly higher uh, that when we decide to not to treat or even wait until transfusion. So this is uh, one thing that I like to highlight. Uh, as, the, as soon as the anemia starts, probably, especially with the site of, of treatment, not related to adverse events and, and with a very good safety profile, uh, we need to improve, uh, the, start the ESA treatment in order to uh, reach a higher percentage of responses and, of course, to improve outcomes. Let's move to um, as the second drug approved in this uh, context, and it is lenalidomide in the context of del 5 q transfusion-dependent patient. And this is, uh, scenario is completely different for the majority of the non del 5 q patients because it's the treatment of choice in this uh, setting. Uh, and efficacy in this subset of patients is uh, even pretty higher because we move for uh, up to 70% of patients reaching uh, erythroid responses and more than 65% reaching uh, transfusion independency. Here you can see our resumes of the different studies performed in this context of transfusion dependency and Del5Q. And here you can see these amazing rates of transfusion independency based on the concept that this drug targets the clonal cells of uh, Del5Q and is able to restore uh, um, the healthy bone marrow uh, hematopoiesis. The median time to response with the, the drug is very uh, quick. In one month, you have responses. And for patients, this is a very dramatic increase in quality of life due to the median rise of hemoglobin increase is about five grams per deciliter. So it's amazing for the patient. Of course, we reach also cytogenetic responses. That is the most interesting for the doctors because that did tra 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 traduce uh, a better situation of the response. And it's based, of course, in this uh, uh, fact that lenalidomide target these clonal uh, cells. This drug is uh, safe and has an oral administration, so it's uh, very good for the patients. We, and we have to take care, especially during the first cycles, with this mild uh, myelosuppression. And this is based to the change of clonal hematology, uh, to clonal uh, cells to the healthy uh, cells. The median duration of transfusion independency is about two years, and uh, the responses and prognosis generally is based on the TP53 status, and it's very relevant for the majority of these patients to check the TP53 status. Here you can see a resume of this uh, status. Is uh, this uh, mutation is uh, very um, occurs in up to 50 to 20 percent of the patients in this uh, lower recent uh, setting with the 5Q and uh, is uh, associated to, uh, in a, uh, to be acquired in a very early stage of the disease, so it's generally present at diagnosis. And if the patient has a very uh, increase in the parallel frequency, clonal site, probably the results of lenalidomide could be uh, poor and probably is based on lower percentage of responses, but also to an increased risk of AML evolution. So probably we have to check, and the recommendation is always to check the TP53 status in order to identify the risk of these other uh, features in this uh, setting. Uh, this is a disease modifying drug, lenalidomide in this uh, context. And when we treat the patients and the patient reads uh, responses, of course, we are going to have an increased 
outcome. And here you can see a resume of the studies uh, performed in this setting when the patient reads even transfusion independency or even also cytogenetic responses that have a prolonged overall survival and a decrease in the rate of AML evolution. So it's an amazing uh, representative uh, example of uh, that if we are able to increase uh, the cytopenia and to resolve the cytopenia, the patient is going to live uh, not only better, but also more uh, with uh, more with this uh, drug. And let's move to only comment on this study. This is uh, the role of lenalidomide in the context of delta 5Q, but in patients with non-transfusion setting. And this is uh, what we have performed in this uh, clinical trial that was uh, presented uh, the last, uh, uh, in the last uh, AS meeting. We identified that this drug could be uh, very uh, interested in this context, but we like to not to wait until transfusion dependency we move for the early phase of the disease and uh, in order to try to uh, avoid the development of transfusion dependency this is the sintra rev clinical trial performed in europe and uh, in this uh, clinical trial we identify this drug uh, as a potential uh, um, drug in order to avoid transfusion in this setting. And we decided to uh, perform this uh, clinical trial in the lower risk and this uh, setting with del 5 q anemia, but no transfusion requirements. The patient in this clinical trial was were randomized in, to receive low doses of LEM, only 5 milligrams per day, per day as compared to placebo, and only for two years of uh, treatment. And when we confirm uh, in this clinical trial is that these low doses of LEM are able to delay and decrease the transfusion dependency is in our cohort as compared to in the placebo R. Uh, median in time to transfusion dependency was not reached in the lenalidomide R and was only as compared to only uh, 11 months in the placebo arm. So I think that it is very useful for the patients because uh, also is uh, associated with very pronounced responses, erythroid responses about 78%, and very interestingly, up to 94% of the patients read cytogenetic responses. The safety profile with this uh, scheme was uh, very favorable. And of course, even that we observe several toxicities with lenalidomide, especially hematological, especially hematological toxicities, some grapes 3, 4, uh, neutropenia, this neutropenia mm, did not associate it with clinical consequences like uh, febrile neutropenia. So it's safe, especially during the, during the first uh, cycles, and it's not related to clinical uh, adverse consequences. And finally, in this study, we also check if this uh, treatment is uh, stable, uh, is uh, safe for the patients regarding clonal uh, heterogeneity and clonal evolution. And we confirm that this low doses of LEN uh, did not promote clonal evolution because we analyze uh, the mut pro mutational profile uh, at baseline and even uh, every six months during the treatment and the long-term follow-up and we did not observe this clonal uh, progression. That is uh, very good for the patient and, of course, for the trial. And we also conf confirmed that even in patients with TP53 mutations, we reach some responses, erythro responses, cytogenetic responses, and the clonal side uh, even responded to the drug. So uh, we uh, did not confirm in this setting, if this is not transfusion-dependent setting, that this uh, mutation increases the risk uh, of AML that occurs uh, if the patient has the TP53 mutation, but of course very uh, late after the discontinuation of the, of the treatment. And very close similar with the placebo arm. So probably if we decide to treat even patients in this setting with no uh, a very big uh, clonal site is a, a possibility to be treated with this drug in this context with a, a safe uh, result. And finally, we have to uh, review the uh, um, situation of lenalidomide in patients, transfusion-dependent patients with non-DEL5Q. And in this setting, as, as you know, this uh, drug is not approved in this uh, second-line treatment, also in, in, in no 
and no uh, any country no no any country has this approved approved uh, proof, uh, for the treatment but i i like to highlight that is an available drug and probably some end results have or, uh, have uh, observed uh, with uh, with this clinical trial performed uh, by dr santini several years ago transfusion independency is about uh, 27% and probably could be improved with the addition of ESAs, according to the American and the uh, French study. This drug is safe in, in oral administration. Only a mild myelosuppression is uh, observed, but the median duration of the response is not too, pro too long, only eight months. And response is probably if we have a patient candidate for this drug because it's in transfusion dependency and failing for other tra uh, treatments, probably we, we can identify these uh, patients responding to this drug according to the endogenous EPO levels. And of course, those with the lower uh, levels of EPO, probably below uh, one hundreds are going to be the patients, as you can see here in the feature, in the figure, uh, that are going to respond better to this drug. So probably it could be an option for a few uh, patients. Let's move now for the novel drugs. Amazing results have uh, occurred recently with the incorporation of loose patterns to our clinical uh, setting. As all you know, uh, when we analyze the process of erythropoiesis, we have to identify that only in the first uh, is, 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 uh, in the first steps of the erythropoiesis, uh, the cells have a, a receptors to EPO, and uh, they are not present in the late uh, uh, phases of the erythropoiesis. When we analyze uh, erythropoiesis in different uh, situations, on different diseases like beta thalassemia or NDS, we confirm that the production of anemia and hypoxia increases the EPO levels. And we have a lot of uh, early progenitors in the bone marrow, but uh, that are not going to translate into uh, red blood, mature red blood cells, and this is based uh, based of the, on the on the on the on the situation that there are a lot of uh, inhibitors of erythropoiesis, different factors that uh, are produced by the mesenchymal stem cells and, diff and other different cells in this niche hematological niche that are going to block this maturation of this increased early progenitors to these mature cells. And regarding this uh, process, we have confirmed uh, that these inhibitors are going to play a, a role with these TGF uh, superfamily uh, receptors. Uh, when these uh, uh, inhibitors of erythropoiesis are uh, going to uh, activate this uh, receptor of the transforming growth factor beta are going to activate a signal pathway that uh, are going to block the different the, the terminal differentiation of the erythropoiesis, as you can see here in the slide, and are going to induce anemia due to the presence of an increased apoptosis in erythroblasts and uh, the cell cycle arrest. The goal uh, of these uh, novel drugs like uh, Luspatercep or Sotatercep is to block these inhibitors of erythropoiesis and be able to, uh, uh, to allow the maturation of the different uh, the terminal erythroblast uh, into red uh, blood, uh, mature red blood cells. And here you can see how the drug uh, works. Uh, Luz Patterson uh, 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 traps these uh, ligands of the uh, receptor of the transforming growth factor beta and inhibit the activation of this pathway, allowing the terminal uh, differentiation of this uh, erythroblast into mature uh, red blood cells. And uh, is independent, of course, of the first step of the EPO uh, maturation. This drug was firstly uh, pro proof in patients with uh, lower risk MDS in this uh, clinical trial several years ago. And uh, this drug uh, confirms efficacy up to 63% of them reach uh, uh, erythroid responses, 38% transfusion independency at higher doses. And uh, of course, in this phase two trial that includes several types of patients, 
they confirm that the most patients uh, that are going to respond the, are going to be the patients with the phenotype of uh, ring sideroblast or S3B1 uh, mutated patients. So uh, this drug was also not associated with relevant as adverse events and did not increase uh, the cytopenia. So this drug was moved to the phase three clinical trial called Medalis that probably all you know. Bruce Patterson uh, is the uh, second drug uh, that, we, that was published in, in New England Journal in Medicine in the NDS setting. The first one was uh, Lenalidomide in 2006, and 14 years later we have the second, the second one, and this is based of based of the results of this clinical trial performed in 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 2022. And, and published in 2020. In this uh, set, in this clinical trial, as, as all you know, lower risk in these patients with the presence of ring sideroblast or a mutation in SF3B1 uh, and in transfusion dependent uh, uh, phase of the disease, refractory or, or uh, intolerant to ESAs, were randomized to receive increased dose of loose patterset as compared to placebo. Those patterns was administered every three weeks subcutaneously, starting at this dose, one milligram per kilo, and increasing up to 1.75 milligrams per kilo every three weeks. Here, as you can see, a resume of the patient's disposition up to 153 patients received loose patterset and 76 uh, placebo arm, and they are uh, typically a lower risk NDS uh, patients. Here you can see the main results. The primary objective of the study was achieved, and up to 38% of the patients reached transfusion independency as compared uh, to the placebo arm in the loose pattern set arm. And this transfusion independency was maintained with uh, a prolonged period of uh, observation as compared to the placebo arm. Here you can see the uh, main results of the transfusion independency. It's not very prolonged when we analyze data, uh, only focus on this first uh, response, median of uh, the uh, duration of the response is only 7.6 months, but we can observe that several patients, more than 50% uh, of them, reach transfusion independency for more than one year. So they seem to have a very prolonged uh, period of response in several patients. When we analyze hemoglobin increases, uh, we confirm that patient responding increases hemoglobin levels between 1.5 and 2 grams per deciliter, uh, per deciliter as compared to those not responding or receiving placebo. And uh, when we analyze uh, all the periods of the patients in which this benefit was produced, not only this first uh, eight week of transfusion independency, also another second or third uh, transfusion independency periods uh, because these patients sometimes have different periods of transfusion independency. If we uh, keep the patient on treatment, we analyze and confirm that uh, probably fit near 50% of the patients are going to be in benefit of this uh, drug. 47% uh, of them uh, reach uh, transfusion in, uh, independency. Uh, as compared to only 50% in the placebo arm. And the median duration of the response is more prolonged, about 20 months uh, of transfusion independency, as compared, as you can see here, with the placebo arm, in which is only 21 uh, weeks. So uh, the main idea of these uh, uh, results is that probably we have uh, some patients with a uh, first and prolonged response, but if our patients in in, in during this is, uh, evolution and treatment uh, needs transfusion. We don't have to keep the patient off uh, treatment. We need to keep the patient in treatment and because probably a second or even a third uh, response uh, can occur and uh, is associated with a, a second or third transfusion independence period. Regarding the safety profile, it's uh, very similar to this observed in the phase two uh, study with no concern is very similar to the placebo arm and I always used to say to the patient that is very similar to ESA uh, safety profile with no serious or adverse uh, or relevant adverse event and uh, is a, a very 
goods administration uh, safety uh, every three weeks. And with these uh, results, this drug has been recently approved in 2020 by the different authorities. Also in India, you have the opportunity to treat the patients with this. After this uh, approval, we have several experience of this uh, of the use of this drug. And here you can see an update uh, of different sub-analysis. This was presented here in, uh, in uh, IHA meeting by Dr. Garcia Manero and confirms the impact of the of the drug in order to decrease uh, transfusion that, uh, as you can see in the slide here uh, on the right, uh, is very clear for patients in the low transfusion setting. Uh, here you can see the patient responding and the expected cumulative number of transfusion units is very reduced in these patients as compared to not responded or um, uh, no responding in Greek, but it's also relevant for the patients in the high transfusion burden. The patients in the high transfusion burden are going to be the patients that are going to respond poor for this uh, drug, but even if, the, if you have a patient responding, uh, this is very uh, of very interest for the, uh, the patient. Also, we confirm that this drug could improve an other uh, cytopenia. And here you can see uh, how different patients in the in the clinical trial increases uh, the uh, numbers and the counts of uh, neutrophils and platelets during a small period uh, of time. And also very relevant is that this drug is especially uh, if, uh, has a special uh, efficacy. In this context, these uh, diseases with uh, this profile, mds NPM uh, profile with fringidroblast and thrombocytosis, we have several patients in the clinical trial with these uh, characteristics. And as you can see in this slide, the responses regarding different uh, parameters, but especially transfusion independency, is even better in this context uh, of this uh, disease. So it's have patients with these uh, uh, characteristics, probably these are going to even respond better to this uh, drug. Also, we have uh, the different uh, ideas, and, and one is that probably this uh, drug uh, is not increasing AML evolution, as uh, we have seen previously in uh, ESAs, but uh, we have confirmed in this uh, presentation in the as a meeting that probably patients in the loose pattern set R could have a prolonged time to AML progression. This result should be confirmed. And also an increase in overall survival was also presented by Dr. Santini in the last as meeting. This result should be confirmed. But uh, uh, at least I think it's not uh, deleterious, but probably could be uh, an improved outcome uh, due to the responses, uh, responses and the low hypoxia and the low um, impact regarding iron overload uh, in the disease uh, of the patients. Finally, I'd like to comment on this uh, compositive, compositive uh, use because uh, when we have several clinical trials, not always the results of the clinical trials are going to translate into uh, the real uh, life. And, and in this uh, setting, I'd like to comment the Italian uh, study that was recently published uh, in, uh, I, I can't remember the, 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 the journal, but it's currently accepted for a publication. And uh, the Italian colleagues uh, performed a study uh, of the compassionate native uh, use in Italy uh, with the same clinical characteristics of the medal Italia, and they included up to 184 patients. And as you can see in the slide, they confirm, of course, all the phase three results regarding the clinical benefit and, of course, the safety profile. And I think that this is very relevant because not always we have the same results when we analyze uh, patients of the real uh, world. And very interestingly, I'd like to highlight this comment regarding the dose level at the first response. Here you can see on the left that when we have patients in the low transfusion burden, the majority of them are going to respond to this first uh, dose, the low dose of loose pattern set, that is one milligram per kilo. And some of them need to increase the dose up to 
as compared to, uh, contrary to this uh, low transfusion burden setting, they analyze patients with the high transfusion burden. And as you can see here, the majority of these patients need to increase the dose up to 1.75 milligrams per kilo. And I think that this is very relevant because if we have a patient in this content in the high transfusion burden and we don't increase the dose up to the maximal tolerated dose, that is 1.75 milligrams per kilo, we probably have a fail in the treatment. So remember that if a patient is not in this setting, uh, even in a, a, any of these three uh, contexts, low, low transfusion burden or high transfusion burden, and is not responding to the first uh, dose level, we need to keep on a treatment and increase the dose um, in order to not uh, fail the treatment. So remember this because I think this is uh, very relevant for this uh, real life uh, cohort. Let's move finally uh, for a novel uh, drugs that are probably coming on the on the nearest uh, months, and I like to focus on imetalstat. Uh, due to the data of the phase three has been recently uh, presented, and they, and they are. Uh, going to be published in, in a few weeks, I think, in a very relevant journal. This uh, drug is an inhibitor of the enzyme telomerase that probably is uh, in a high activity in these uh, diseases. And uh, this trial, the phase two design, uh, phase two design was close similar to Medalis clinical trial, but in which in this trial, uh, focus on lower risk setting, uh, failing to ESAs and in the transfusion dependent um, patients with and without residual glass, this is the main difference of the two clinical trials, they uh, confirm very efficacy uh, results, very relevant efficacy results. The treatment, as you can see, these are the phase two clinical uh, results, uh, reach up to 40% of transfusion independency with a prolonged uh, duration of the transfusion independency. And especially in this uh, setting, in this clinical trial, we confirm that there are a lot of patients within the high transfusion bar. And also different from the um, um, loose patterns uh, drug, uh, uh, the phase two uh, trial confirms that this drug may have an effect on the malignant clone because it seems that this is this drug should be a disease uh, modifying drug in this uh, treatment. And uh, is when they analyze uh, the parallel frequency of the patients uh, before and after treatment with imetalstat, they confirm that the parallel frequency of, uh, for example, different uh, uh, genes like SF3B1 uh, are going to decrease after treatment and this decrease is associated with a uh, treatment response. With this uh, data also they confirm that adverse events are also different because um, they, uh, the patients included in this trial uh, had uh, relevant grade 3 and 4 cytopenia, neutropenia and uh, thrombocytopenia, but in this uh, two cytopenia did not as, uh, were associated with clinical consequences. And as you can see, these uh, cytopenias are not translated in febrile neutropenia or bleeding events. And in the majority of the patients, in more than 90% of them, they are going to um, uh, resolve in the uh, uh, one in the month uh, after administration. This drug is administered intravenously every month and in the majority of the patients they are going to recover for this uh, toxicity after uh, one month of treatment. Here you can see the design of the phase three trial that is uh, going to be published in a few weeks as I had previously commented and include patients with the same characteristics, low recent DS with and without reinsider blast and in the transfusion-dependent uh, setting. Imetestat was compared to the placebo arm. Here you can see the main patient's characteristics, including patients with and without reinsideroblasts, and in the majority of them with a high transfusion burden uh, in the 50% of the, of the patients. And the results are uh, presented here. Up to 40% of the patients reach this transfusion independency as compared to the placebo arm. 
and the median duration of this response is about 51 uh, weeks, near one year of this uh, duration of uh, the response. Here you can see the patients that are going to respond to this drug, not only rinsideroblast patients, also the results uh, confirm that patients with no rinsideroblast are going to respond even better. And also compared, as compared to Bruce Patterson, even patients with the high, within the high transfusion burden have, are going to have a very high rates of transfusion independency. Cytopenias are confirmed in this uh, clinical trial also, but also also uh, to short duration and manageable with no clinical consequences uh, in the patients. And uh, they also confirm the reduction of the valid frequency of different genes, as you can see here in the slide for SF3B1, TEC2, confirmed that this drug could be as a disease modified. The reduction in this uh, um, clonal site is always associated with uh, improved uh, responses and probably, we don't know, uh, with an improved outcome. And here you can see how the drug is associated, the responses of this clonal, in this, with this clonal site is associated with an uh, improved uh, and prolonged uh, transfusion independency uh, of the patients. Here you can see the conclusions on this trial. We are waiting for the approval of this trial by FDA and for the current publication that is going to occur, I think, in a few in a few weeks, and probably we have a novel uh, treatment for our patients in the near uh, future. And finally, I'd like to move to these uh, two hypomethylating drugs. Hypomethylating drugs uh, could be an option in a few patients uh, with lower risk uh, setting. And now, as all you know, we have these two drugs uh, in the oral setting, not approved uh, in uh, any country outside the uh, United States. But I think it's uh, of interest to, to comment on it because it could be probably in the near future an option for uh, the patient. CC48C is an oral compound of azacitid that was tested in patients within the lower risk setting uh, several years ago in transfusion dependent patients, but also with the patient of thrombocytopenia. This is a very uh, complicated uh, type of patients. And the results, even that uh, show with an increase in the, in the erythroid uh, responses and in the transfusion independent setting, they also confirm a uh, very relevant toxicity regarding adverse events, regarding non-hematological, but especially hematological uh, adverse uh, uh, events that uh, requires uh, a several dose reduction or even discontinuation. And finally, the patients included in this trial uh, during the first months uh, uh, and receiving the drug have an increased risk of mortality due to this adverse event. So this drug seems to be um, uh, uh, with several, uh, with uh, some efficacy, but this toxicity is going to block our utilization nowadays in this uh, context. There are a new clinical trial in this setting, and probably with uh, lower doses and different controls, could be an option in in, in a few years. These are the results of this uh, drug. And another one is, uh, is uh, uh, this novel compound, IASTX727. This is uh, in like a uh, desitabine, but in an oral uh, compound. And this uh, study confirms that uh, this is uh, in equivalent to uh, intravenously desitabine. And in this context, also in the lower risk setting was uh, confirmed, uh, desitabine cetazuritin, confirms that play a role in the reaching transfusion independency in the patients, up to 50% of the patients reach transfusion independency and even uh, platelet independency. And this, uh, 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 the duration of this uh, uh, benefit is prolonged, but again, the myelosuppression uh, occurs uh, in these clinical trials and is very relevant in this sense, subset of patients uh, and translated in, again, those reduction and interruption. So the safety profile is, is still not very good uh, for these patients and they are new, not needed uh, for further investigation uh, in order to improve uh, the outcome. So I'd like to only uh, comment on these drugs because probably in the near future, we are going to have 
severe the results of different clinical trials with lower doses in order to reach uh, a benefit in this uh, set. And finally, I'd like to comment to new arrivals because care 15 is a novel uh, inhibitor of TGF and beta ligands and uh, also promotes erythropoiesis but thrombopoiesis in clinical uh, models. And uh, the phase two trial is, uh, is uh, conducted with more than 59 patients included, and the result was recently uh, presented in the last uh, EHA meeting by Dr. Jagunidis, and he's going also to present an update in this last meeting. And the responses are pretty uh, good, near 40% of them. Is also uh, a safe drug in this context. So I think during the next uh, uh, months or years, we are going to have a new option for these uh, patients. Finally, I'd like to comment on the current management of these patients. When you have a patient with symptomatic anemia, uh, we need to treat the patient. Of course, if possible, and if, uh, if you have a clinical trial in your unit, uh, it should be the best uh, first uh, uh, try, uh, uh, the best option because uh, even that we have several drugs, uh, I think that always a clinical trial is uh, the best option for the patient. In first light, we have uh, ESA for the majority of the patients, but probably not the best option for patients in transfusion dependency uh, with a high endogenous level and probably this uh, rinsidroblastic profile, plus Pater said, probably could be uh, an option in the near uh, months uh, regarding the results of the commands trial. And also is approving patients that are not going to respond to ESA. In second line, after EPO failure or relapse, I, if the patient is in the rinsidroblastic profile, we have, of course, loose patterset and probably in the near future in metal style, probably for the high transfusion burden the, based on the data of the EMERGE trial. And if the patient is not uh, having this uh, profile, we have to wait for the EMERGE uh, trial, lenalidomide, or also ipomethylating agents, but only in the patient uh, has uh, with uh, poor risk feature and in low doses. And finally, uh, remember that the role of lenalidomide in the del 5 q setting. Uh, and this is my last slide. We have uh, our national meeting uh, this weekend, and, and, and this is a, a picture for our team in Salamanca in uh, in uh, in the meeting. And that's uh, all. Uh, thank you very much, uh, and we can move for the for the question. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maria Campello, for that wonderful talk. Real update from A to Z, everything you covered, including what is in the horizon for the new molecules. So we have our colleagues who may be interested in asking some questions. May I ask you one question? Uh, is there any data of using loose patricept after EPO failure? Uh, after? A failure of the erythropoietin stimulating agents as a second line. Uh, and patricept in patients of transfusion uh, dependent low risk MDS uh, as a second line after the EPO has failed. Yes, yes, I think that uh, these are the results of the um, medalist trial in second line with, uh, with, no. Without ring hydroblasts. Ah, ah, yes. Uh, sorry, because I, I didn't didn't understand very well. Yes, in the in the phase two trial in the PACE study uh, uh, published in, in 2017 by Dr. Platbecker, they included also patients with no rinsideroblast. And the result was also very promising because they have probably between 20 percent of responders. Uh, and especially the patients that are going to respond to this drug in this context are those with the low endogenous EPO level. Luspater said in residroblast uh, phenotype is not associated, response uh, to Luspater said is not associated to the EPO levels uh, when we are analyzing patients with residroblast uh, phenotype, but in the context of no residroblast, uh, uh, the responses of this drug is based uh, on endogenous CPO level. So probably if you have a patient with no rinsidroblast and a low level of EPO, probably uh, endogenous CPO levels, probably they are going to respond to this drug. And, and regarding um, 
the commands trial, the commands trial uh, that uh, uh, contra uh, that compares uh, loose patterns with ESAs in first line treatment uh, with transfusion dependent patients. In this uh, in this trial, they included also patients with no ring sideroblasts in first line, and some response occurs. Yes. I, so I think this is a promising drug, but the company only focuses in this uh, setting of rinseidroblast, but probably it could be another uh, an option also in patients with no rinseidroblast phenotype. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes. Questions, please. Yes, Dr. Akamshan. Yeah, good afternoon, ma'am. Thank you so much for the comprehensive talk. So my question is that uh, when you start the patient on losparticept, uh, once they start responding, then what is your protocol for uh, uh, reducing the dose? And uh, have there been any patients who have been uh, off losparticept after uh, uh, achieving a, a certain target hemoglobin level? Yes, Th this is a very good question because uh, we have to learn a lot of about how to use this drug. And, and I think it's very, pretty similar to the ESA, when we have a, a pronounced response of, uh, with loose Patterson, and probably the hemoglobin level is up to 11.5 uh, or uh, 12, you can stop the drug and monitor uh, the hemoglobin. And you can, of course, reintroduce the drug uh, when the hemoglobin drop, uh, probably in <clears throat> between 10 or 10.5. I think that uh, the, the use uh, of this drug is close similar to uh, ESA, and, mm -hmm. and you have to, uh, um, to treat the patient uh, very close similar because uh, this is a dose-dependent drug. So when we stop the drug, generally the patient um, uh, have a drop in the hemoglobin. We have um, in, in Spain nowadays a, a clinical trial uh, performed in Europe, we, in which we start with high doses of loose patterns. Uh, we start uh, in the first uh, dose that the patient receives is uh, of 1.75. And we have, have a patient in our center that uh, in which with this dose, the hemoglobin increased up to 40 grams with only one dose. And uh, the patient uh, uh, is uh, about two or three months with no treatment and with this hemoglobin level. Nowadays, uh, see the hemoglobin drop, and we have reintroduced the drug at fifty percent of the of the level, mm -hmm. dose level, mm -hmm. and see it's very very good because probably this is a, a new option to start, uh, especially in several patients in in a in a subset of patients to start in higher doses uh, is not approved, so only in clinical mm -hmm. setting, but probably it could be an option for several uh, months uh, to start uh, in the higher dose level, especially for those in the high transfusion environment. I think it could be uh, a, a very good approach if uh, the trial confirms uh, this benefit. And is it possible to uh, like increase the gap of the doses like from three weeks to maybe five weeks or six weeks, or it doesn't work like that? I'm not sure. Probably the patient is uh, responding. You can delay the administration uh, of the dose, but I think there is not uh, probably not possible when you have uh, uh, not um, a dramatic response of more than 12, 12 grams or something like this. I think you should keep on, on, on three weeks uh, scheme. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. I have a question with respect to the adverse effects. Are there any adverse effects which uh, force you to stop the drug? I think that this uh, drug is also very, very safe. And, and in no, our experience, we don't have any relevant adverse event. It's associated sometimes with uh, increased uh, hypertension, but I think that it's not uh, even frequent or 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 relevant. So in, in our experience, it's very close, similar to, to EPO, and you can use uh, the drug very safe uh, with no several concerns. Some patients uh, associate with cephalia, but um, I think the, the, the safety profile is, is, is pretty, pretty good. Yeah. And like in thalassemics, there was some incidence of thromboembolism. Uh, mm -hmm. Is it here in MDS? No, in, in NDS, this is not associating with uh, with this uh, adverse event. 
yeah, like it happens with <clears throat> other drugs because uh, in lenalidomide is also associated with these events in other diseases, but in the context of Del5Q, there is no association uh, also. Probably it's more related, uh, these uh, thrombotic events are more related with the, with the disease more than the than the drug because in the NDSS it uh, is a, a rare uh, disease and uh, adverse event and I think we we in general we don't have uh, to take care about it. And the skeletal muscular pain is also not a big problem. No, no, nothing. Doctor Amit, your question. Thank you, ma'am, for that wonderful talk. I've got two three questions, ma'am. The one is basically, do you start GCSA for every patient of low-risk uh, MDS presenting with anemia? Uh, this is a very good question because I think the role of GCSF is sometimes uh, of interest. I, I never start GCSF. I only start with ESA uh, in first line. But if the patient did not respond after eight weeks, we can try not all the patients are going to tolerate GCSF due to the leukocytosis and sometimes pain, but uh, if the patient tolerate, we have up to 20% of responders of this drug. So probably you should not to start in all patients because if the patient is going to respond to ESA, it's not necessary. But if the patient fail after eight weeks of ESA, you can add GCSF in order to try to 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 reach the response. That probably occurs about 20%, yeah. And the second question is basically, if you're starting with GCSF, what is the dose of GCSF you use? <laughs> yes, this is a very good question because if you use a high dose of GCSF uh, weekly, uh, the patient probably did not tolerate. I used to uh, divide the dose in three times per week and the patient administered on Monday, Wednesday and Friday. Uh, and probably mo no more than 100 uh, mi micrograms per dose. Uh, we divide the dose in three times, and it's very good tolerated with no an increased risk of uh, adverse events. And and this is uh, our scheme in, in Salamanca, at least. Thank you. Sir, can I ask one more question? Oh, of course. Uh, regarding the dose of LEN in FICO deletion as well as known FICO deletion, what is the difference? What is the dose you use for FICU deletion and what is the dose to be used for non FICU deletion? Yes, I think that uh, for FICU deletion, uh, when it's approved uh, in transfusion dependent setting, you should use uh, 10 milligrams per day. But it's true that probably you need to, to, to keep into account that if the patient is in cytogenetic response for at least 6 or 12 months, you can um, stop the drug. Uh, and wait, because we have several patients that uh, reach cytogenetic response in the DEL5Q setting that have a prolonged response uh, without the drug. And you can stop the drug for several, even years, uh, uh, and, and the patient is still in, in complete uh, cytogenetic remission. Because in this, uh, in this setting, um, the goal is to reach cytogenetic response. And if you reach this response, you can skip, uh, stop the drug and, and move on on um, only clinical setting. If the patient relapse and become again anemic, you can reintroduce the drug with the same effect and uh, reach again the goal of hemoglobin increase. And in the non-DEL5Q setting, of course, I think that we used to... to to use the, also 10 milligrams uh, per day, yes. We only use uh, five milligrams in our clinical uh, trial, in the sintra clinical trial, in the early phase of the disease, when the patient is anemic, but not in transfusion dependency. And in this setting, we confirm that it's not necessary to move to the 10 milligram per day dose, because with low doses of five milligrams per day, we reach a very good responses regarding cytogenetic responses and hemoglobin increase. So probably if you treat the patient early, you need a low level of LEN, but when you, the patient is in transfusion dependency, at the beginning you need uh, to, to reach cytogenetic response and probably you need the 10 milligrams per day. Thank you. 
So can I ask one more question? As many yes, as yes, of course. <laughs> so, ma'am, can you please tell me that what is the time when you will label the patient has erythropoietin failure? This is a difficult question. It depends uh, if you have any other option sometimes. Because if, if you don't have any other uh, option, sometimes the patient is on, on, on ESI treatment for several uh, months. But uh, I think that uh, objectively, if you don't have any change in, in the transfusion dependency after eight weeks of ESAs alone or after 16 weeks of the combination with uh, GCSF, I think you can uh, stop the drugs. But sometimes if you don't have any other option, for example, if the patient is uh, with no rinsidroblast, uh, where loose patercept is not approved, uh, so sometimes you keep the patient on treatment for for um, even more than, than this because you don't have another option. And, and sometimes it's, it's, it's difficult to keep the patient without the treatment. And, uh, but generally, I used not to, to wait for more than eight weeks uh, for this uh, treatment if there is no, no movement uh, on, on hemoglobin level or in, in transfusions. And is there any data regarding if a patient feels lenalidomide? Can we switch over to thalidomide and the patient has responded? Can you? Sorry? In... If the patient has failed lenalidomide, and if we switch over to thalidomide, the patient can respond? No, I, I think this is not a, um, um, an option, at least in our country, it's not, a, it's not approved. And, and I think that uh, if the patient is failing, lenalidomide, probably the, the clone could be, uh, could be resistant to lenalidomide and it could be also resistant to thalidomide. Probably if the patient is failing to lenalidomide, the, the disease is not too, too low. Uh, in the low risk profile, probably the patient could have a TP53 mutation with a high allele burden, and probably you should move to a, another approach more more closely to the high risk uh, disease. It depends on the on the situation, but but generally it's not associated with um, with this uh, low risk phenotype. But sometimes the patient is, in, is even in the low risk phenotype, but we don't have any clinical trial. In, in, that include delta Q patients because all of them are excluded for loose patterns, uh, for uh, uh, metal stat. Uh, and, and we don't know, probably if the patient is still in the lower risk uh, setting, probably it could be a benefit for this, but they are not uh, included in this clinical trial, so, so we don't know. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Just one more question in the same context. Uh, what about combination of uh, ESA and lenalidomide? Yes, I think that uh, for patients in the non del 5 q setting, I think they, some data mm, allow us to increase uh, the percentage of responses. So in this setting, I think this could be uh, a good approach. If the patient uh, started with len and, and did not respond, you can increase uh, the percentage of respondents adding ESAs. But uh, it's not approved, but it is, of course, uh, an option for several patients in order to avoid transfusion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Dr. Saroj, your question. Thank you, ma'am, for such an uh, informative talk. Uh, my question is on uh, ESAs. So what dose and frequency of uh, Darby Poitin you prefer to start with? And once you achieve good results, do you change frequency or you lower the dose for the patient? Yes, I, I think that there is very, a very good point because in, in Europe, we perform a clinical trial with doses of darbepoetin of 500 every three weeks. And it failed because this is not uh, good for this subset of patients. Probably for other anemias is 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 good, but uh, in the MDS setting is not a very good option. And we in in Spain we decided to start always uh, in the higher level of dose that is three hundred micrograms every week. And if the patient responded, we decrease fifty percent. But um, we prefer to start in the high dose level uh, because safety is very good and uh, adverse events are not, um, not relevant for the patients and, and we like to reach response. If the patient responds, we decrease uh, up to 50% uh, the dose in order to 
maintain to keep the the hemoglobin level. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, one more question, ma'am. Uh, do we use aspirin or any prophylaxis for anticoagulation with len 10 mg in MDS? Mm, no, no, no. We don't use it. No. Uh, okay. Generally, generally, no. No, it's not necessary. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Dr. Y.M. Uh, Ma'am, thank you for the excellent talk. Um, the question is regarding the uh, usage of linalitoma and anti lesion 5Q and any experience of using cyclosporin alone without ATG according to your experience. And my second, second question is regarding your usual management of fibroblastic MDS. Mm, this is a very difficult question because uh, um, okay. uh, immunosuppressive treatment is uh, always uh, uh, recommended is in several patients, but in my clinical experience, I've never used uh, this uh, this treatment because generally the patient the patient uh, need to have a very good profile for respond should be younger uh, than probably sixty five. Uh, Yes, in order to try to, to use not only cyclosporine, also ATG. The combination, I, I think, is more effective in this context, but it's very toxic for the majority of the patients. So in, in my clinical experience and, and even in, in the Spanish experience, we, we don't generally recommend it, uh, this, uh, dream, this uh, treatment because we don't have a, a, a very good uh, patients uh, candidates to this. If the patient is in the lower risk setting and probably is in, in a severe cytopenia, probably is in, if it is young, we proceed to allotransplant and, uh, and not to this uh, treatment that sometimes uh, is... Um, patient response, but for a short period of, uh, of time. And after that, uh, we are going to, to need uh, another treatment. So in my experience, uh, we don't use uh, this, uh, this uh, type of treatment. Sorry. Yes, thank you. Uh, uh, and th yeah, please, go ahead. Uh, regarding linalitruma, usage of linalitruma in anti-lesion 5 qs in yes. uh, I think that this is a very good point because sometimes if the patient fails to ESA and you don't have uh, another option, uh, probably you can choose lenalidomide in the non-del 5Q setting. And we identify the patients based on the EPO levels, endogenous EPO level. If the patient is uh, with less than 200 uh, units per liter, probably the rate of response could be a uh, up to 40 percent so we we try uh, this uh, drug uh, for at least three or four cycles and if the patient did not respond we we skip but uh, it's a, an option because it's an oral drug and, and probably the patient could, could respond and in this setting you can uh, use the combination with the ESA because probably it increased the percentage of respondents so it's a, a good option for only a selected type of patients yeah Yes, thank you, ma'am. Uh, may I know uh, your usual first line treatment for hypoplastic MDS? Hypoplastic. Well, the, yes, it depends. Uh, when we analyze this data, we identify the, the risk and the cytopenia, and we we don't ha take into account if the patient is or not in the hypoplastic. Is in if the patient is in the lower risk setting, we treat uh, as normal uh, no, normal patient. Uh, we treat the patient based on the risk and the type of cytopenia. If the patient is in the uh, presented anemia, we used to treat with ESA or yeah. or, or, the EC, uh, or even if the patient uh, is in thrombocytopenia, we can use uh, TPO analogs uh, in this context that are safe also and, and have a per percentage of efficacy. If uh, the patient is in a hypoplastic um, situation in the higher risk, we used to to treat as a high risk patient. It's not uh, related to the to the um, hypoplastic or not. Uh, it's more related to the risk and the site opinions presented by the patient, at least in 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 my region. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. When you're using TPO analogs, is there a choice between uh, Altrambopag and Ramiplastim, or both are equal? 
Bo both are equal. We firstly use uh, romiplostin several years ago in the clinical trial, and, and this clinical trial stopped it due to um, um, a false alarm of AML uh, evolution. Uh, after that, the results were analyzed and the investigators confirmed there were no concerns about the use of romiplostin in this in this setting. And in, in my practice, we have both a type of patients receiving romiplostin or l and both are have the same uh, efficacy and safety. I think that you can choose uh, according to the patient's preference, if the patient prefers to to take an oral drug or even subcutaneously, because sometimes the thrombocast back is not very good um, uh, tolerated, and we have moved for, for, from one to other. But I think that there is a very good drug, not approval, of course, but but of interest in patients, selected patients with no excess of blast. I think that this is a. Uh, um, uh, characteristic of the patient. We cannot use in the lower risk setting if the patient is in an increased excess of blast, uh, but if the patient has less than 5% of blast and a thrombos, symptomatic thrombocytopenia, you can choose between one or, or, or the other. Yes, and, and I think that responses are, occur uh, very frequently and the tolerate, tolerability for the treatment is very good. Yeah. And in MDS, Sitting, uh, setting, what is the dose of this starting dose of l pack and romiplostin? You can start with low doses, but in the majority of the patients, you have to move for the highest uh, dose level. I think that for uh, l pack it's up to 75 milligrams, and with romiplostin, it's also uh, up to 1,050. I, I, I can't remember very good because it's uh, not, uh, but you have to move generally uh, for the highest higher doses, uh, starting in the low, but uh, try to move if, if the patient did not respond. And, and generally with the higher doses, the patient should uh, respond. Yeah. Dr. Asharafu. Uh, thank you, Madam, for your nice uh, presentation. Madam, I have a question. Uh, is there any role of roxadastate that is hypoxia inducible factor in MDS? Uh, well, this is a very good question because this drug was uh, has been tested in, in MDS, but uh, the results uh, were not positive because I think that the drug is uh, physiologically mm, uh, have a physiological uh, act, but in the clinical setting there is no potent. I think that this this compound is. Uh, with low efficacy because of the of the power of the drug. Uh, in the clinical setting, uh, the patient selected to receive this uh, oral compound was those with a very low transfusion burden, with very low endogenous CPO level. And in this context, the drug was uh, efficacy, but uh, during a, a short period of time. So probably this drug could play a role in combination with other uh, compounds, for example, with ESA or with loose patterset. There are no clinical trials ongoing in this setting, but I think that the, the, the drug uh, in this context still is not, uh, is not, uh, not, not, has not a positive role. And, and the results of the paper, I think that still they are not uh, published, but are negative. They, they did not uh, reach uh, the, the, the primary objective and is not approved in this, in this setting. Thank you. Uh, thank you, madam. Uh, Ashok. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, madam, for a lucid and informative uh, presentation. My question is regarding uh, my question is regarding uh, heavily transfused patients of MDS. In such a patient, after how many weeks of treatment with Luspartraset with uh, normal doses, uh, you increase the dose to a uh, higher level like 1.20, and uh, and particularly at after what time we consider it as a, a non-response. Yes, this is a very good point because uh, we have to learn a lot about how to use this drug. And you start at the one milligram per kilo dose. You need to receive, the patient needs to receive at least two doses of this drug, of this uh, dose, 
And if the hemoglobin level did not increase and the transfusion dependency did not move, you can, after that, move to the second dose level, that is 1.33. Again, you have to wait until two new doses uh, of this uh, dose level of 1.33. And it, if there are no change, you can still move to the 1.33. 75 milligram per kilo. So more or less, you need to wait until six weeks to go to the highest dose level if the patient did not respond any uh, any 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 type of response regarding hemoglobin or regarding transfusion dependency. And when you are uh, on the top of the dose level, if the patient after two or three doses uh, of 1.75 did not have any benefit regarding hemoglobin level or even decrease in the transfusion burden, you can uh, skip uh, the drug due to um, no efficacy. Yeah, And this is the reason why uh, in Europe we are uh, performing a clinical trial uh, to the reverse. We start with a high uh, dose level, 1.75, and uh, in order to reach the response uh, early, and uh, if the patient responds, we move to lower dose level. Uh, this is like the ESA's uh, treatment, I think. Uh, probably we need to start at the beginning with a higher dose level in order to reach response, and after that, adequate the dose to, to the patient. But in the clinical trial uh, approved, uh, we need to wait, and, and the approval uh, drug uh, with Luz Patterson nowadays, we need to wait until six weeks in order to, to reach the, the high dose level. I, I think this is important, especially for the high transfusion burden patient, because in the majority of these patients, we are going to need the high dose level um, and we have to wait uh, until six uh, six weeks. Yeah. Um, and one six more doses. Uh, can I ask one more question? Yes. So the Targeted therapy uh, with inhibitor, inhibitors of I, ISO uh, cited like IDH1 uh, and 2. So, patients with SDS with mutation in IDH1 and 2. So, is there any role of uh, targeted therapy uh, inhibi IDH1 and 2 inhibitors in this uh, patients of MD? Yes, I think that th there is a very good uh, point. In the in the high risk setting, there is a presently approved uh, for IDX1 in USA, um, and uh, uh, there is no any any other country in the world with this approval. But uh, in Europe, in the lower risk setting, we have uh, the combi uh, the cl a clinical trial with IDH1 and 2 inhibitors in the lower risk setting. The French uh, colleagues are uh, testing this drug in this context with a very promising results. I think the last uh, as meeting, they presented data of efficacy, but they have only a few uh, patients, less than five, I think, per uh, drug. And probably this year in this as meeting, could be, uh, we could have an update. But there is a, a role in the, even in the lower risk setting uh, in this uh, percentage of patients with, um, with this uh, mutation. So, so I think during the next years, we are going to have a promising data of this, uh, of this drug even in the lower risk setting, yeah. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Amit? Yes, I just wanted to know about the role of iron in low-risk MDS. At what time point are you starting iron in every patient with a low-risk MDS? And at what point are you of? Yes, I, I think that there is a very uh, in, in important question because, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, all the patients that uh, are in transfusion dependency need to be uh, chelate, chelated because uh, these patients um, uh, have a prolonged life expectancy, survival in the majority of these patients is prolonged for more than more than six years in the majority of the of the patients. And if we don't uh, chelate uh, the patients, uh, the iron overload is going to decrease uh, over a survival due to uh, especially cardiac toxicity. In our experience, the patients after uh, 40 to 50 uh, red blood cell transfusion 
started to, to present with uh, uh, cardiac damage and they presented with cardiac fail, with arrhythmias that um, uh, are going to uh, increase mortality in this setting. So in our uh, clinical perspective, uh, when the patient starts with uh, transfusion in this setting, due to that we don't have a very uh, lot of drugs, uh, like in other diseases, uh, and the efficacy of these drugs is uh, not uh, more than 30 to 40 percent and duration of this is not more, more prolonged than one year, we used to start iron chelation uh, as soon as the transfusion dependency occurs. If the patient is very well chelated and the, and the uh, levels of ferritin are uh, below 500, we stop. Uh, but it's, um, but generally this uh, situation did not occur. So sometimes the patient, uh, if the patient responds to to luspatercept or uh, to EPO and uh, become transfusion independent, then see we have several uh, periods uh, during the patient can be off uh, treatment of iron chelation, but in the majority of them, we need to, to chelate. And we generally use uh, XJ as first line, and deferoxamide uh, as first line treatment, but we also have to take into account that the deferiprone is also possible to be used if the patient did not tolerate. And the main goal is to try to chelate in order to avoid uh, cardiac complications that we think that are going to be the cause of death of these uh, patients. So if the patient is in, in this setting of transfusion dependency, we start generally the, the iron chelation treatment. Yeah. Thank you. Dr. Gopinathan. Uh, good afternoon, ma'am. Thanks for the elaborate talk. Uh, Ma'am, we do encounter some patients who are EPO refractory, LEN refractory, and uh, they may not be that much affordable to access uh, lispatacept. And these patients get aluminized at will uh, sometimes because of multiple transfusions. So what would be your approach to this set of difficult patients, Ma'am? It's, it's very difficult because uh, if you don't have any option, you need to keep on transfusion and on iron chelation. And uh, regarding other available uh, drugs, sometimes we can uh, take into account uh, as a side thing. But I think that uh, this uh, alpometylating J agents in this context should be taken uh, um, uh, take with cautions because you, you need to, to use low doses, only five days probably, uh, of as a side thing and to take care very um, uh, about the, the complications, infections and cytopenias, because sometimes if you, um, if you don't keep the patient very closely on treatment, you can have an adverse event that uh, increases mortality or morbidity. So I'm not uh, very, um, uh, I, I, I not use as a second in a second, a second or third line treatment very frequently in this subset of patients. Sometimes, yes, when the patient especially have another adverse features, even in the lower risk setting of severe cytopenias or an excess of glass, and probably in this setting, it could be an option. Uh, more than this, it's difficult. Also, if the patient is, is young and is in transfusion dependency, you can ask uh, for a allotransplant, but uh, in the majority of them, they are not uh, in the uh, appropriate age. And also, you have to take into account that this is a procedure that uh, could be associated with an increased risk of mortality and morbidity. So I think it's, it's a difficult. We have I have in my clinical setting several patients with no other option, even that we have a lot of clinical trials, uh, and, and but these uh, uh, diseases are associated with a prolonged survival and no uh, several uh, options for treatment. So, so you have sometimes this, this setting in the clinical practice. Yes, it's a common type of patients, yeah. Um, many a times, uh, this lenalidomide will cause a lot of neutropenia, particularly when you put for elderly patients above 60. Uh, in that case, sometimes we try to manage with GCSF, trying to decrease the duration of uh, len and trying to decrease the dose. So is there any lowest cutoff time point that like at least this much days of len we should give or it is like patient dependent? How do you take a call on this one? I think that you have to, especially in the context of Del5Q, neutropenia occurs in the first cycles because we are moving for the clonal 
del 5Q hematopoiesis to the non del 5Q normal one. So during these uh, these periods, you have to try to keep on treatment with lenalidomide because uh, the, the drug is effective and you need to eliminate the clone and you can use uh, GCSF, of course. And I think that uh, you have to carefully review the patients every week uh, in order to try to avoid complications. Uh, after that, after the first cycles, I, I think that the majority of the patients uh, tolerate well the, the scheme. And if you need to go down to five milligrams uh, when you have a cytogenetic response, uh, it's completely, um, completely good because uh, you have to decrease uh, toxicity. But also you need to, to wait until response uh, at the beginning to, with a carefully uh, review of the patient. And after that, you can move to the lower dose level. Because at the beginning, I think it's, it's very relevant to read responses. And when the five uh, uh, dose level, the re cytogenetic response is uh, pretty low. So probably you need to try to, to keep on, on 10 milligrams uh, dose, at least uh, until cytogenetic response. And after that, you can decrease uh, and those level. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if you have severe cy pancytopenia in a transplant eligible younger patient, you go directly for allo transplant or you give them HMA a couple of cycles and then go for transplant? No, if the patient did not have an increased uh, blast count, we move for um, for allotransplant directly. Yes, because uh, as a society, I always say that is the last <laughs> the last uh, drug that we use in the patient because after as a society, the patient generally is not very good and and and, and probably is not necessary if you are going to move to transplants. If the patient did not have an increased blast count. You can move uh, directly for for allotransplant, like like in an aplasia, because uh, it's like this uh, disease. Yes, and sometimes when you treat with sasatidin, you can have an adverse event that uh, delay or or uh, finally uh, uh, stop uh, to move to to transplant due to this complication. And if you have five percent, seven percent plus. Up to 10, we, we move directly to transplant, yeah. Mm -hmm. If you have identification of the uh, a donor, or uh, probably you can. If, if you are going to delay the transplant up to four months, probably you can try uh, as a site uh, even with this low blast count, because of, uh, uh, in order to increase site opinions. But if you can proceed to the transplant in one more or, or, two, or two months, probably you don't need to to move uh, to to start with a society then. and if you decide to start probably in the low dose level of only five days <coughs> can i ask you a question for the higher risk mds yes yes, yes. Mm -hmm. what's the situation of venetoclax with hma in this situation <laughs> I think that we have to wait for Verona trial that is currently uh, ongoing and probably I, I, we are going to have results very very pretty soon. I, I have several concerns about this combination because even that I think that is a promising combination of regarding responses, but I think that is too toxic for the, the majority of our patients and probably uh, I'm not sure if finally the the outcome of overall survival, that is the primary outcome of the clinical trial, could be achieved because of the toxicity. I think in my experience, we use this combination outside the uh, approval uh, and outside clinical trials in young patients, candidates for allotransplant. And we used to uh, combine as a cycling with venetoclan is the patient is going to to move to a allo transplant. We decide to to start with this combination instead of a high dose chemotherapy, uh, because I think it's better for the patients and their responses are uh, very uh, quick and very profound. Uh, but in the older patients with high risk NDS, I have several concerns. I need to to see the data because I think 
is a efficient uh, drug, but probably too toxic for uh, at the at the uh, proposed scheme. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I, I think uh, probably it could be fail, but uh, we don't know <laughs> because uh, we have uh, assist to several other combinations of azacitidine, uh, not too toxic, and all all of them fail, like pevonedistat and recently sabatolimab. Uh, these compounds associated with azacitidine have a very good safety profile and they fail uh, to reach the primary outcome. So I am not sure with this other compound, very toxic, uh, because uh, the combination is too, too toxic for the patient regarding hematological toxicity. I'm not sure if uh, it, 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 this combination are going to improve uh, out, out, uh, outcome overall survival in this, in this setting. I, I have several concerns. I have to see the data. I, uh, probably... In the near future, I think in the next uh, ASCO meeting or IHA meeting, we are going to have the, the final results. Of course, I wish it would be positive for, for patients, but I think that especially for older patients, is I'm not sure if it's going to be, uh, is not going to have uh, good news. I'm sure. Right. Are there any other questions, please, for them? Okay. Yeah. Amit, you have a question. Yeah. Uh, many, any uh, experience using lispartrap in hypoplastic MDS? No, I, I think that this is a very strange uh, situation, uh, and it's not. Uh, I, in the clinical trial, there were several patients with low uh, bone marrow cellularity, but I think that it's not uh, included in this uh, setting as as this. We don't have several experience, but of course, uh, the mechanism of action could play the same role than in than in the others, but we don't have several species. Probably know that it's approved in, in several other countries. We have some experience in the lower risk setting, but I don't have any experience in this in this setting. Sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, so may I invite Dr. Uh, Mr. Sumit Madan for the vote of thanks. Yeah. Uh, Thank you, uh, Dr. Maria Campello, for sparing your uh, valuable time. It was a wonderful presentation, and uh, uh, we have many key takeaways from this uh, uh, wonderful presentation. On behalf of Zydus, I thank Mumbai Hematology Group, Dr. M.B. Agarwal, for providing us this uh, wonderful opportunity and making us a part of this esteemed academic discussion. I also thank our chief guest, Dr. Manish Nema, all the discussants and participants who have joined us from this for this webinar. Last but not the least, the series of webinar is possible only because of continuous support from Perfect Square team. So thank you so much, everybody, and have a wonderful Sunday. Thank you, Mr. Sumit. Thanks to Zaidas. And once again, on behalf of Mumbai Hematology Group, Dr. Maria Campello, thank you very much for sparing your morning on a Sunday <laughs> weekend for the academics. A lot of people have logged in from all over the world, and I'm sure the care of low-risk MDS will be much, much superior from today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to participate in these amazing meetings, and congratulations for your for your proposal of uh, of, for, of uh, sessions. It's amazing to see that every Sunday you are learning a lot of different topics. So it's uh, it's amazing. Thank you very much, and congratulations. Bye bye. Thank day. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.